Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the Avexia webinar series. Our topic for today is the autism microbiome, signatures and solutions. My name is Christopher Chu. I am the Director of Marketing for Avexia Diagnostics and will be your host for this webinar. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by an exciting guest, Dr. Ari Calhoun, ND, who will be our presenter for this webinar. Dr. Ari Calhoun is a prenatal and pediatric naturopathic doctor, certified functional medicine practitioner, and MAPS practitioner. She is passionate about helping her clients achieve an optimal state of health. With a background in clinical research, she blends the wisdom of ancient medicine with the cutting edge knowledge gained from modern science, including genomics. She feels strongly that each of her patients is a unique complex being who requires an individualized comprehensive approach to facilitate healing. Dr. Calhoun, earned her naturopathic medical degree from Bastyr University and graduated summa cum laude from Syracuse University. Dr. Calhoun developed a special interest in complex pediatric disorders, including autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, ODD, PANS, PANDAS, eczema, food allergies and intolerances, and autoimmune conditions. She has a private practice in San Diego called Wholesome Brain Medicine. Without further delay, I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Calhoun. Welcome, my name is Dr. Eric Calhoun. I'm a naturopathic doctor specializing in neurodevelopment and pediatric mental health. I have a practice in San Diego, California called Wholesome Brain Medicine, where we take a integrative and functional medicine approach towards all things pediatric brain health, including autism. And today I have the honor of presenting Flory Clinical's most recent publication on the autism microbiome, as well as precision-based symbiotic supplementation. So today in this webinar, we are going to be talking through how the microbiome influences neurodevelopment and autism symptoms, microbiome signatures that are associated with autism spectrum disorder, innovative and personalized approaches for microbiome remodeling, and finally, the impact that personalized pre and probiotics can have on overall microbiome health, as well as autism symptoms themselves. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar of the biomedical or functional medicine approach towards autism, we really believe strongly that autism symptoms are not fixed and can be greatly improved and altered through a systems-based approach. And so we don't see the brain as separate from the rest of the body, but that by addressing imbalances within these other systems can have a really big and significant impact on autism symptoms and ultimately the patient's quality of life. And so these are some of the areas that we focus on in practice. The first being the immune system. So we understand, and there's a huge body of literature to support that immune dysregulation oftentimes coincides with altered neurodevelopment. So we look at immune dysfunction in these early years and how that can shape the early architecture of the brain and how immune dysregulation in later years can contribute towards symptomology. Next, we look at toxicology, including metals, molds, and environmental toxicants, some of these having more of a significant impact than others. So within the metals realm, we have really good literature for lead and mercury and arsenic, um, certain mold toxins, and then certain environmental toxins, including pesticides, the pyrethroids, organophosphate pesticides, um, different types of uh, herbicides like glyphosate and uh, atrazine, uh, the plasticizers, phthalates, and, and BPA and others. We also look at mitochondrial dysfunction. So we know that the mitochondria are, are energy producers in each and every one of our cells, but they are densest in our muscle tissues as well as in our brain. And we know that our brain is an extremely metabolic organ, consuming up to 25% of the energy that we create each day. And so for optimal brain function, we need to have optimal mitochondrial function. We realize that neurotransmitters and neuroendocrine imbalances can really shape our behavior. And we definitely understand that there are changes that can be made through dietary and nutritional interventions. And last but not least in the area that we're gonna be focusing on today is the gut microbiome and gastrointestinal health in general and how that can really impact the brain. 
And one of the things that we know to be true is that the microbiome does not operate in isolation from the other systems. And in part, the way or the reason why it is so impactful to start with the microbiome or alter the microbiome is that it has a profound influence on these other systems. And so the area that I'm personally most interested in, and I think we have, again, the most research on, is its influence with immune regulation. And so the microbiome can be very regulatory for the immune system or when in a dysbiotic state, it can be a huge contributor towards immune dysfunction and systemic and neuroinflammation. So one of the ways that the microbiome supports immune regulation is through production of short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids are also known as postbiotics. And one of them that is most significant or um, beneficial is butyrate. And so butyrate can upregulate T regulatory cells. It can increase our anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10. It is known to deactivate the microglia or the immune cells within the brain. It can support gut barrier function and a whole host of other benefits through the the, the, you know, the simple action of this one short chain fatty acid. On the flip side of this, if we're in a dysbiotic state, um, especially if we have an elevation of certain gram negative bacteria, we get an increase in lipopolysaccharide production. And this lipopolysaccharide has been known to disrupt gut barrier function, increase systemic inflammation, and activate the microglia, increasing neuroinflammation. From a neurotransmitter aspect, we know that the gut is the primary producer of neurotransmitters and that these neurotransmitters can interact through the brain through vagal nerve communication. And then we know that the microbiome influences nutrient synthesis as well as absorption. So it's really crucial for synthesis of some nutrients, and we'll go into um, one particular one today. And then it influences how we're able to absorb certain nutrients from our dietary intake. Finally, um, the microbiota is impactful in our ability to eliminate toxins. And so a lot of our toxins that we are exposed to are eliminated through our stool and a dysbiotic state can impact that elimination process through um, upregulation of something called beta-glucuronidase, which can cleave some of these toxins from their binding protein and allow for recirculation. The microbiome can also be a source of toxins themselves by production of endotoxins. And so when we look at the microbiome, one of the things that we really can recognize and appreciate right off the bat is that it's quite unique from individual to individual. So 90% of individual humans differ from one another in terms of their microbiome. And this is quite profound, especially as we compare it to the human genome, which differs between any two individuals by less than 1%. And as Hippocrates once said, all disease begins in the gut. We see that through the literature and through clinical practice that 90% of the diseases that come into our practice can be linked back in some way to gut health and the health of the microbiome. So when we look at autism, we can see such a quite a span in symptomology and presentation. And when we are addressing the microbiome, I think we can all appreciate that this also deserves a unique um, and differing approach, personalized approach for each patient that walks through our door, recognizing that there is quite a significant variation from individual to individual. And so, you know, quite often, and one of the most long-standing kind of interventions for our patients is probiotics. And um, when we're looking to shape the microbiome, that is oftentimes one of the foundational aspects that we use in practice to support remodeling of the gut microbiome. So a uh, very simple, and I'm sure everyone is somewhat familiar with this, but a very simple definition of a probiotic is a live bacteria or yeast, which has some beneficial effect on the body. We can get probiotics in two main ways. We can either get them through dietary supplementation, or we can get them through fermented foods and drinks, such as kombucha, kefir, sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, tempeh, and a growing list of those fermented foods. And probiotic supplementation has been shown to support uh, the, the supply of those friendly microbes, so improving these beneficial and probiotic species. It can help fight off less friendly types of bacteria. They've been known to boost immune health. They can prevent and treat these dysbiotic signatures, reduce inflammation, and regulate the bowels. 
Now, what can be difficult for a clinician is really figuring out what is the right probiotic for our patient. Um, I think we are you know, presented with more and more formulations each and every day, and there's such a difference you know, just coming down to the concentration of the probiotic. So are we starting with 1 billion CFU? Are we going to 100 billion CFU? As a pediatric provider, I think this, there's even more variation here and trying to choose, you know, what age is it appropriate to jump up to a 10 billion CFU or 30 billion CFU. Um, a lot of our infant formulations start at 1 billion CFU. So just really understanding the concentration can be kind of the first difficulty. Then I think the next difficulty is understanding what is the best strain to be used in this particular individual, whether we're looking at the microbiome analysis itself and wanting to address a particular imbalance, or we're looking at a particular symptom and wanting to address the symptom with probiotics, what is the best strain for the condition at hand? And then other details in terms of like, should it be refrigerated or not refrigerated? When is the best time to give the probiotic for the most effective results? And there's been an exponential growth in microbiome research over the last 20 years. We are now to date at over 2,000 publications per month, which is just quite mind blowing and can also be quite overwhelming as a clinician to be able to keep up with the latest and greatest research and how we can really apply these new findings to our clinical practice. And so Thomas Edison, once said, if there's a better way, um, or if there's a way to do it better, then find it. And Flory Clinical has been dedicated to doing just that. Um, one of their missions is to be able to support clinicians in efficiently and effectively um, supporting this remodeling of patients' microbiome through a science-backed and precision-based approach. They are also very dedicated to contributing to the depth of literature themselves. They published their first um, research publication on irritable bowel syndrome, and their second publication was published earlier this year on the autism microbiome. And so in April, um, earlier this year, they published the largest study on the ASD microbiome to date, and we will be diving into that today. One of the most profound things that I found as a clinician is that just with three months of prebiotic and probiotic supplementation, 60% of the participants that completed this study um, reported improvements in their autism symptomology. And as a um, integrative practitioner that uses quite a, you know, um, expansive, um, you know, approach towards gut remodeling, I'm was quite surprised and shocked that a prebiotic and a probiotic supplementation alone could have such a significant impact. So this study, um, it looked at just under 300 participants within the ASD group, and the control group consisted of 123 neurotypical controls. The median age for each of these groups was just over 10 and a half years of age. At baseline, um, researchers gathered samples, fecal samples from both groups, and additional surveys were sent to the ASD group. They included behavioral surveys, and there were three behavioral surveys, the parental global impressions of autism, the screen for childhood anxiety and related disorders, and the social responsiveness scale. The gastrointestinal assessment included gastrointestinal symptoms rating scale, and then there was a nutritional assessment. After those fecal samples were collected, they went through whole genome shotgun metagenomic sequencing, and the post-analysis consisted of taxonomic composition, metabolic pathways, and gene families. After the stool samples were collected and analyzed, and the um, behavioral surveys and gastrointestinal surveys and nutritional surveys were all collected, then the Flory clinical team personalized the symbiotic formulations for each of the ASD participants. These included four to eight probiotic strains and one to two prebiotic strains, which were all tailored to the individual based on this initial microbiome analysis and the analysis of symptoms. After three months of supplementation, there, were a, there was a second fecal sample collection, and there was also a repeat of these behavioral and gastrointestinal surveys. All right, so we can see some significant differences 
between the initial samples taken from the ASD and neurotypical cohorts, uh, the ASD population had a significant higher number of gas producers. They also had a higher number of pathogens within their stool samples, and they had a significantly lower capacity for short-chain fatty acid production. When we look over at these metabolic capacity trends, we can see a lower potential for GABA degradation, a higher potential for LPS production, and then a lower potential for thiamine phosphate synthesis. And we will talk a little bit about why each of these are important in the next slides. So why do we care about gas producers in our autism population? We know that gas can contribute to a significant amount of abdominal discomfort, and that clinically we see this associated with increasing behavioral concerns. We know that higher pathogens are often associated with a more pro-inflammatory response and that this inflammatory response can impact systemic and ultimately neuroinflammation. And there's a significant body of literature to show that the that individuals with autism have dysregulated short-chain fatty acid production and that upregulation of propionate has actually been associated with behavioral and neuroinflammatory changes seen in autism. While butyrate can be quite protective, it can dampen microglial activation directly within the brain um, that's caused by lipopolysaccharide. It can improve gut barrier health, mitochondrial function, as well as a host of other immune regulatory properties. So what was really promising to see is that after three months of pre and probiotic supplementation, we saw within the ASD cohort, there was a significant reduction in these gas producers, a significant reduction in these pathogens, and an improvement in this short chain fatty acid production or the capacity for short chain fatty acid production over time. GABA degradation is important for these individuals as it's been associated or imbalances, I should say, with GABA have been associated with developmental delays and neurodevelopment disorders. LPS has been directly implicated to be involved with ASD as it is known to cause a imbalance in cytokine regulation and activate the microglia within the brain. And lower thiamine phosphate synthesis um, is important because thiamine deficiency has been associated with altered neurodevelopment and has been identified as a risk factor for autism, as well as in um, speech and language deficits. So again, after three months of pre and probiotics uh, supplementation, there was an improvement with GABA degradation. There was quite a significant reduction in these uh, this LPS production or this, this potential for LPS production. And there was a significant increase in the ability to synthesize thiamine phosphate. So what I'm gonna walk through next are three case studies and each of them just kind of show a little bit about how these formulations differ for the patient and the clinical thought going into the formulation for each individual based on what is seen um, within the symptom analysis as well as what's seen on the um, stool microbiome testing itself. This first study is going to really highlight an individual who is struggling with a um, at a high level of pathogens. And so the pathogens that are most important within the ASD cohort are listed here. Um, many of them we've seen in our practice, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, Salmonella, Clostridia being one really important one in autism itself. So this individual was an eight-year-old male. He was consuming an egg-free, dairy-free, gluten-free diet and he presented with symptoms of diarrhea, as well as obviously a diagnosis of ASD. The researchers or the clinical team, I should say, chose a 14 billion CFU per scoop dose, which is actually low for an eight-year-old. Um, but this was chosen because this individual had indicated that probiotics in the past may have contributed to the diarrhea. So they wanted to take a more um, reserved approach initially. So the strains that were chosen um, for some of the ASD symptoms included lactobacillus ruteri, which has been shown to improve social functioning, likely due to its ability to increase oxytocin, synth oxytocin synthesis, um, lactobacillus plantarum, which has been shown in studies to improve behavioral symptoms, such as disruptive antisocial behaviors, anxiety, impaired impulse control and communication difficulties, and then green tea extract, which has been shown to improve mood issues, anxiety, um, and energy. 
For diarrhea and clostridia, there were three species that were chose, the Streptococcus thermophilus, the bacteria Breve, and Lactobacillus rhamnosus, all for their utilization in decreasing the diarrhea and C. diff. And then finally, the prebiotic that was chose was coconut water powder. And so you can see from time point one to time point two, which was over a three month span, there was a significant reduction in the C. diff population. And then from time point two to time point three, so I didn't mention this earlier, but many of the study participants um, elected to continue supplementation and testing thereafter. And so the additional time points were taken um, following additional supplementation and testing. And you can see that that pathogen abundance stayed and remained low with pre and probiotic supplementation. The next study is looking at an um, adult, and this particular individual's area of primary concern was lower short-chain fatty acid production. And so when it comes to the short-chain fatty acid producers, here are a list of the short-chain fatty acid producers that the Flory clinical team is looking for and looking to improve with supplementation. Um, the top being that fake alley bacterium, which we know is so important for immune regulation. And so this individual was a 34-year-old male. He had no specific dietary practices, but he presented with acid reflux, heartburn, bloating, and a diagnosis of ASD. The clinical team chose a 32 billion CFU pill, which is higher for an adult at, on time point one, but this was chosen because the customer had previously used probiotics and had had a high amount of pathogenic bacteria that the clinical team really felt um, required a more aggressive dosage. So again, the lactobacillus ruteri was chosen due to the diagnosis of ASD in hopes of improving some of the social functioning challenges that he was dealing with. And then there were a number of species that were chosen to directly target and decrease the E. coli that was found in his stool above the 3%. Um, he also had a high abundance of acromancia, which has been shown to contribute to gas and um, some uh, disruption within the gut microbiome for some individuals. And so flaxseed powder and chia seed powder were used to target that acromancia and lower the acromancia groups. While he had a low production of that fecali bacterium, which is a big, big butyrate producer, and banana powder was chosen to improve that fecali bacterium. We know that resistant starches, um, and that is the banana powder itself, is shown to improve that particular um, bacterial group, which then increases short chain fatty acid production. So you can see with this individual, he didn't have a huge increase at, from that time point one to time point two, but with consistent supplementation over time, we do see an increase in that short chain fatty acid production. And this just highlights that we can't always give up on a therapy right off the bat, and that especially when we're building these commensal bacteria that are not, um, we can't give directly in a probiotic, it can take a little bit of time through dietary modulation and prebiotic supplementation to see an improvement within that short chain fatty acid production um, capacity. This final study is a, a child case study with an individual who had high amount of gas producers. And so these are a couple of the gas producers that they are looking at. Um, again, many of us are familiar with the DeSalvo Vibrio and the Methanobacter as high gas producers and implicated in SIBO and a number of other um, microbes within the gut that can be high gas producers. And so this was a six-year-old female. She had no specific dietary practices, but she was a very uh, picky eater. She presented with constipation, uh, difficulty passing stools, bloating, gassiness, and as well as a diagnosis of ASD. So again, similarly, there were study or there were um, probiotic strains that were chosen for the ASD diagnosis. There was also a probiotic that was targeting the constipation itself, so the Bifidobacterium longum. And then she had a number of these high gas producers and pathogens that were targeted independently. So the Salmonella and the Porphyromonas um, were targeted with different strains. And finally, an improvement um, with Lactobacillus, or I'm sorry, with the facial bacterium was achieved through the Bacillus um, strain and oat fiber. And so you can see over time from time point one to time point two to time point three to time point four, she had a significant reduction in these gas producers. 
All right, so this is taking a look back at the uh, behavioral and, uh, and symptom analysis that were taken post three months of pre and probiotic supplementation in that ASD group. And you can see that over 50% of the participants reported improvements within stool and GI problems after the supplementation and over a 60% improvement in autism related symptoms which again, to me is quite profound, was such a simple um, intervention. And so how might you get these custom probiotic solutions designed specifically for your patient, their microbiome and their symptoms? Well, again, Flory is committed to being able to support you with that goal. They formulate formulate based off of what's missing in the stool analysis, what's too high. All the strains that are needed for the individual can be found within a single serving. And so that is either a single scoop for our younger children or a capsule for those individuals who are able to swallow capsules. And it's tailored, again, to your patient, everything down to the, the concentration, the CFU dosing, um, your microbiome is unique, and so why are we utilizing stock formulations um, when we have a better model to really treat the individual uh, differences within our patients in front of us? We can be able, or we, our patients can access these pre and probiotic, these custom formulations through a couple of simple steps. The first step is just to utilize a survey to assess symptoms, and that um, is reported through a health and dietary survey. The second is to share microbiome data. And so Flory can support you with being able to access a microbiome testing directly, or you can send in any testing that you prefer in your clinical practice. So there are um, any testing that you've used or you, you use in your practice and like to use in your practice, that data can be submitted to Flory directly. Flory then um, their clinical team and analyzes both the symptoms that are reported within the health and dietary survey, as well as the microbiome data, as well as your input as a clinician in terms of what you feel might be best for this patient to then develop a custom pre and probiotic formulation for the patient in front of you. Um, this really eliminates the need to use these stock formulations or multiple stock formulations to be able to accomplish what the desired intention is. Uh, it's created based on the patient's unique right, microbiome and health concerns. We don't have to worry. I think one of my biggest concerns as a clinician is that a lot of the stock formulations might contain um, species that are beneficial, but might also contain some species that are either unnecessary or potentially harmful in certain cases. They come for our individuals that can swallow capsules and an acid resistant capsule, which expands the number of live probiotic strains that are being able to be utilized. And it's formulated with the patient's allergies, sensitivities, and dietary restrictions in mind. And working with a very sensitive population, we make sure we give the clinical team as much information as possible so that they're able to remove some of these sensitive species. So the histamine producers or the gas producers, et cetera. Now, as a physician um, in you know, this space, I think we're all very concerned and um, about sourcing. And so Flory Clinical um, takes this issue to heart. And so they are sourced from industry leading nutraceutical suppliers such as DSM and Fonterra. They have stringent third party testing to ensure that all, um, to ensure you know, all ingredients safety and concentration before they are able to accept them into the manufacturing facility. And the manufacturing facility itself is third party audited. It's a UL certified facility. For any questions or issues you may have, please contact Avexia Diagnostics by email at info at avexiadiagnostics.com or by phone five days a week at extended hours, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time at 888-852-2723. Thank you, Dr. Kellen, for this informative presentation. Thank you all again for joining us for this webinar event. Until next time, from everyone at Avexia Diagnostics and Flore, stay healthy, stay safe, and we wish you all the best on your pathway to wellness.